Hello, good afternoon and welcome to today's episode, first episode in the Flex System G webinar series. Today's episode is going to be focusing on biochar, its production routes, its properties and potential uses. So before we begin and I hand over to the speakers, I'd like to just tell you some housekeeping rules. So if you do have a question, please, all questions are very welcome, but I request that you write them into the question and answers box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can, of course, use the chat, but this chat is just for saying hi, welcoming yourself, uh, presenting yourself. But uh, any questions, please do use that box because then it will be recorded as a question and we can answer it fully either within the show or afterwards. So thank you very much and welcome to today's webinar. We will be starting with Claudia Banuki from IFA. She's part of the research project Lexus and Gene, and she'll be telling us about the production pathways and properties. Then we'll be moving on to Mauro Giorcelli from Politecnico di Torino, and he is our special guest speaker today, and he'll be telling us about the utilization and potential markets for biochar. And then we'll be heading back again to IFA where we'll hear from Carol Witowski, who's going to tell us about the Flex System G concept and biochar characteristics and applications uh, in relation to the project itself. So with that in hand, I hand over the floor to Claudia. Welcome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, can you hear me well? I can hear you well. Yeah, perfect. Then I will be sharing my screen. Please let me know if you got any issues. We can yeah, see. There yes. should be it. Now great. it's perfect. Okay. All okay. Uh, well, thank you, Emma, for, for the great introduction. Uh, so, yes, I'm Claudia Vanucci from IFER, and today I will briefly introduce you biochar production pathways and properties. So, we've got only 10 minutes, so we'll get straight to it. So, here is a really short overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, I want all of us to understand why are we organizing a full-on webinar on biochar. Then we'll dive, dive a bit more into how it can be produced, what are its properties, and how can it be used for, what it can be used for. So first of all, uh, why biochar? Here in the background, you can see a beautiful picture of a biochar, which is basically just a porous and carbonaceous material that is obtained from biomass pyrolysis. And uh, I think it's important to understand why biochar is, biochar is so relevant in today's environment. And for that, I've got three figures for you. So first of all, it's 2050, which is the year by which several countries and even full-on continents, aka Europe, have pledged to be carbon neutral. And carbon neutral doesn't only mean renewable energy technology or electric mobility, but also actually uh, capturing and storing carbon into different materials and pathways. Uh, for that, we have six options for the creation of negative emissions through carbon sinks, and biochar is actually one of the six options. And 6%, which is the estimate global emission that could annually be uh, removed by biochar. So I feel we've talked about this amazing material, and now we got to figure out how can we produce it. Uh, there's many different pathways, obviously, but we only got 10 minutes. So we're going to focus mainly on pyrolysis, gasification, and hydrothermal carbonization. So let's say old uh, way of producing pyrolysis, been there forever. Gasification, still old, but a bit newer, and hydrothermal carbonization. So a bit more into the future, let's say. So not the state of the art as of right now. So bear with me. It's lots of simple drawings. Uh, they're not super accurate in the sense that this is not the uh, important part right now. It's just to have an overview of the process and mainly what are the products that we obtain from each different process. So here you have a brief, brief schematic of a paralysis process. Uh, what I would like you to remember is what we get out. So we get out a syngas, a bio-oil and biochar. So as said before, paralysis is the most common pathways for producing biochar as of right now. It is a thermal decomposition of organic materials that happens in an oxygen-free environment, temperature range between 250 and 900 degrees Celsius, 
and it has a time frame of hours. It can be slow or fast, meaning um, slower or faster heating rate of the biomass, and that varies the time a bit. But all in all, the time frame is within hours, and it, the pyrolysis process yields a biochar in 10 to 30 percent mass of the biomass feed, feedstock that was introduced. So when we move on to gasification, uh, again, simple schematics, main output of a gasification process is, as I think the name says it, uh, a syngas. So biochar, it is considered a byproduct in this case. It is, again, a thermochemical process. Uh, in this case, we need gasification agents. It can be oxygen, air, steam, depending on the case and the layout and so on and so forth. It has a much higher temperature range of up to 1,400 degrees Celsius that translates also in a much shorter time frame. So we're talking about seconds here. And since biochar is considered a byproduct, the biochar yield that we have in gasification is 5 to 10 percent mass of the biomass feedstock that is introduced. So we're much, much lower than before. And now uh, hydrothermal carbonization. In here, again, what we obtain uh, is a syngas, a biochar, and processed water, because contrary to what we've seen so far with pyrolysis and gasification uh, that usually require a drying step of the biomass, here we actually blend biomass with water. So it is actually a wet process, and it is sometimes referred to as wet torrefaction. So basically, usually the biomass that we use for uh, hydrothermal carbonization is a lower quality biomass, if you will, that it's not usable, for example, for gasification applications. It has a much lower temperature range in between 180 and 250 degrees Celsius, and it has a higher biochar yield, both in terms of uh, mass percentage of mass from the introduced feedstock and also in um, higher carbon content when it is compared to uh, pyrolysis and gasification, but as I said, it's more of a newer process, so it is less used as of right now, even though it produces more biochar, pyrolysis is still the main pathway for the production of biochar. So now, what are biochar's properties? So first of all, we can have both physical and chemical pro properties, sorry. A, as a general description, um, biochar is composed by an amorphous structure, but it can also have uh, some local crystalline structures that can represent the conductive phase of the biochar, if you will. There's obviously um, other components like residual volatiles, inorganic ash, and all in all, at the site, it presents itself as a you know, carbonaceous dark material that is also very porous. From a chemical perspective, we said it's carbonaceous, so obviously it got lots of carbon. And it also contains varying amounts of other elements like hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and some minerals that are the result of the biomass feedstock that is used. So now we'll briefly go over a few of the key properties for biochar. So as for physical properties, first one that we like to talk about is the pore size. So there can, as I said, porous material, there is different pore size and can be also uh, distributed in different ways on the biochar surface. Uh, why are they important? Because a um, higher porosity, if you will, can uh, significantly impact the opportunities for industrial application in the sense that if you have macropore or micropore, like that influence the way the biochar will behave when it is applied. So for example, uh, micro, mic, sorry, micropore are, are highly desirable because they are directly linked to a higher nutrient absorption capacity when it is used in soil amendment application, for example. And to obtain uh, more micropores, uh, we would need a higher pyrolysis temperature and a lower heating rate to ensure that we have a lot of micropores. Uh, when we concern about particle size, so the biochar particles, we would like them finer because finer particles can be more easily integrated in soil matrices, again, if we use it for soil amendment and improve soil water uh, holding capacity. So we would like them fine, to have them fine, we want a slow pyrolysis uh, with a lower heating rate that generates smaller particles. And all in all, the main uh, parameter that influences the particle size is the biomass feedstock. So it's rigidity and agglomeration during pyrolysis.
Concerning density, when we talk about density for biochar, we have two types of density. So we got soil density and bulk density. And usually when one of these properties increases, the other one decreases. Soil density is more on a molecular level, so it represents the degree of packing of the carbon structure. And all in all, it increases when the paralysis temperature is higher and there are longer residence times. And it is also influenced by the biomass feedstock, so lower volatile and ash content will result in a higher solid density of biochar. When it comes to bulk density, it is a bit different and it's in, in different in the sense that it considers also the porosity of the material and the voids in between particles. And it depends mostly on the nature of the biomass feedstock and on the process. process. All in all, um, what we would like to have is a higher density biochar because it reduces the storage costs, it increases the carbon sequestration efficiency and its mechanical stability. And linking onto that, the um, biochar mechanical strength is obviously closely linked to its solid density. So a higher mechanical strength is obviously more desirable in biochars that could be used for construction materials, for example. Now, moving on to chemical properties. The first one that we wanna talk about is the carbon content. So as we said, biochar is predominantly made of carbon, which is typically in the range from 50 to 90% in mass of the total biochar. And this property affects uh, biochar stability. It's carbon sequestration potential. I think it goes without saying that if you have a higher carbon content then you're storing more carbon and its ability to serve as a long-term soil amendment. So obviously if we have a higher uh, carbon content by mass feedstock, we will have a higher cumber content uh, biochar. But also uh, we have a high carbon content in the biochar if we have a high temperature paralysis. Now, uh, surface functional group, I'm not a chemist and I haven't been in a chemistry course in quite some time. Uh, so bear with me if maybe I don't pronounce them perfectly. But biochar surfaces contain yeah, certain functional groups that could be hydroxyl, carboxyl, phenolic or carbonyl groups, and they influence biochar's reactivity or nutrient adsorption capacities or interaction with uh, soil nutrients and contaminants when used for um, soil amendment. Uh, all in all, uh, I think it goes without saying that what, what is the greater influence onto the surface functional group of the biochar is the chemical composition of the biomass feedstock and also the type of technology that is used in the sense that uh, we've talked about absence of oxygen, presence of oxygen, steam, whatever, so on and so forth. And obviously I think we can all understand that if we have oxygen present in the process, then some functional groups would be more likely to form than others and so on and so forth. Uh, the biochar pH, uh, also a very important parameter if you consider the, its application in um, soil amendment or agriculture, it is usually, yes, in the range of seven to 10, so acidic to alkaline, and it can influence the soil pH when it is applied or the nutrient availability, the plant growth, and so on and so forth. And uh, in this case, if we have feedstock with a higher ash content, uh, we will most likely have a biochar with a higher pH because of uh, alkaline minerals and compounds that are in the ash. And if we have higher paralysis temperature, uh, this can also lead to uh, biochar with higher pH levels. So depending on your application, you may want to tailor that. Now, on our final chemical property of today, it's chemical stability. So chemical stability basically measures the biochar resistance to the composition and mineralization over time, and how long can we use our biochar and how long it will be stable for. So basically it's longevity as soil amendment or carbon sequestration agent, so how long it stays stable. And usually we have a higher chemical stability, which is desirable by the way. Uh, if we have a higher paralysis temperature, a biomass that has a higher lignin content and mineral present in the biomass feedstock, such as calcium, magnesium, and potassium. So um, yeah, we had a brief overview. I know I've been doing rather quick, uh, but we got limited time. So we got time for question later. Uh, our properties depend as we've seen from the biomass type. So higher lignin content, lower 
Campbell content or not that influences obviously uh, the type of biochar they will have. Maybe there are some um, hazardous materials or so on and so forth. So that will influence the chemical composition of our biochar, the type of technology. So we've seen, we have different types of technologies. We have a higher or lower yield of biochar, can have oxygen, not have oxygen, that will lead to different functional group and the operating parameters. So basically mainly um, temperature of the pyrolysis process, the residence time and the heating rate. So those are the main parameters I would say that can influence the properties of our biochar. And now what can it be used for? Yeah, sorry about that. You will see about its applications in the, in the next presentation, uh, but I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you, Claudia, and for that nice te teaser onto Mauro's presentation. Uh, we just have <laughs> one one question for you. Um, it's quite a maybe difficult question, but um, it's asking. Oh, okay. Do you have any idea about the cost of the three technologies that you mentioned? Your three pathways. Oh, ouch! Uh, I think <laughs> uh, no, not really. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, it's, uh, I think we can say it's very variable and depends yeah, on lots, yeah, lots of Yeah, it varies factors. a lot on the size and yeah. Uh, yeah, the fits the chain. I think there's lots of different things that you can take into account. And I don't know if maybe, yes, mm. any of the of the other speaker, if you have any idea of it, <laughs> please feel free to take the floor. Uh, but no, me personally, I don't know. And just one very quick question before we go into Mauro is, do you know what the most common form of um, feedstock for biochar is uh, another, I, another quite difficult one. <laughs> yes, no, because I think you can basically make biochar from anything. Uh, mm. I would, you know, I would think most common is wood-based stuff, like I don't know, um, mm. yeah, wood leftover or trimming or like anything. Yeah, yeah, anything yeah. on on that area. Uh, Yes, I think that's, let's say, it's also the most common used biomass feedstock. So that, I think maybe that's why it is the most common uh, biomass that is used to make biochar. But yeah, mm -hmm. I feel it is expanding very much. There is lots going on into the biochar field, like um, within the uh, carbon sequestration uh, measures, if you will. Mm -hmm. 40% uh, of the entire literature uh, available is on biochar. So it is quite yeah a growing field i would say great excellent well thank you so much for that and uh, now we'll move on to Mau mauro so are you there you could turn on your screen and your camera and share your screen and uh, the floor is yours thank you we're going to hear about utilization and potential markets so probably something that everyone's interested in now <laughs> okay thank you so much you can uh, see my screen can you hear me well Yes, yes, we can hear you and see you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So first of all, thank you to you for the invitation, the nice invitation. I uh, always enjoy to take part of this type of webinar, especially on the biochar where I work, as uh, you well know, with my team. And uh, we are uh, based in uh, Polytechnic of Turin, and uh, we are uh, biochar specialists uh, with uh, our group. Here, I want to talk to you about the biochar utilization and potential market uh, of this extraordinary carbon material. So I want to just uh, to underline a little bit the importance of the biochar, why biochar is important, is a very important material. It's not only because it's a, a, a carbon material that can uh, substitute the carbon material derived by oil, but uh, also because it helps us to bring down the uh, CO2, the carbon that we have uh, um, in an excess in, in the atmosphere how we can, we can do it. So uh, essentially what is the main problem of uh, our day is that uh, the excess of the carbon material that is present in the atmosphere. And uh, because it's uh, present, because essentially we, 
increase uh, a little bit the carbon content, uh, burning uh, um, fossil fuels, uh, is essentially uh, not renewable materials like uh, oil and uh, carbon and, uh, and so on. And so we produce an excess of the CO2 in the atmosphere. But uh, uh, to bring down these carbon materials uh, is a help by us from the photosynthesis. So essentially the trees uh, absorb the CO2 uh, carbon material, the carbon, the CO2 from the atmosphere and grow the, um, grow the biomasses essentially. But what's happened at the end of the life of the biomasses? If we take the biomasses and we burn the biomasses, essentially all the carbon that they sequestrated during the, the, the their life, they back to the atmosphere. And so uh, the, the sequestration of the carbon is uh, uh, zero. And so this is a CO2 neutral uh, uh, circle. But uh, if uh, we... Uh, create, uh, sequestrate the carbon in, during this circle using uh, uh, the production of the biochar material uh, through the pyrolysis system, we are able to sequestrate the carbon that uh, the biomass is absorbed during the, their life. And so they see the carbon to don't back to the, to the atmosphere. This is essentially the core, very important uh, of, uh, of, the, of the biochar, that it is able to create a CO2 negative circle in order that we are able to decrease the quantity of the carbon of the carbon materials uh, that is present in, uh, in the atmosphere. So essentially, the, the main question is this, would we able to create a society that is able to sequest more carbon that is that uh, it produces? Because as you will know, it's not possible to do not produce a CO2 because essentially part of, of the life. But we have uh, what we have to do is uh, to uh, sequester this uh, carbon, and uh, of course, biochar could help us to do it. So. I repeat uh, this uh, very important things in my opinion, that uh, biochar is not only a material, but is a way to sequester the carbon from, from the atmosphere. And because this is very important uh, to produce a lot of quantity of, of biochar in order to sequester carbon and to create a CO2 negative uh, circle. So essentially what we have to do if we want to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere, absolutely we have to stop burning things from the, the wood to the petroleum, to the carbon material and so on. And so, on. so we are arrived as Bill Gates tell us in a, a way where we is not necessary to not, not produce uh, CO2 or decrease the uh, producing of CO2, but we have also to be able to sequester the CO2 from, uh, uh, from the atmosphere. And because this, the biochar is very, is very important. So the biochar helps us to compensate uh, the CO2 that we produce, because as uh, I told you before, it's not possible to do not produce CO2, but what we have to do is uh, to sequester. So we have to create a CO2 negative, uh, um, CO2 negative ways uh, to uh, pull back uh, the biochar from the atmosphere. So uh, essentially, there are a lot of uh, ways to do, to do it. For example, here you can see a carbon capture technology where the people think to absorb the CO2 from the air and to put uh, uh, CO2 somewhere, uh, some, somewhere in order to store the CO2. But if you think very well, this work is done by the tree, as I told you before, by the biomasses. The biomasses, the tree, help us to um, to capture the CO2 and to transform into oxygen. The only things that we have to do is uh, we have to do a, a step, a step further. So we have to um, sequestrate this carbon that is uh, absorbed by uh, biomasses. And uh, essentially what we have to do is uh, to produce uh, uh, biochar. So uh, uh, biochar represents a concentrate of the carbon that is absorbed by, by biomasses uh, during their life. And so as uh, um, was very, very well explained before, uh, using the pyrolysis system and starting from the biomasses, uh, essentially I wanted to underline that uh, 
it's very important that they are waste biomasses, not main biomasses. Uh, so I give always a, 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 um, an example. Uh, for example, a banana. Okay, a banana, I eat the banana, but with uh, the external part of the banana that I don't use, I can produce the, the biochar. And uh, using the pyrolysis, that, as you well know, is essentially uh, a burning process, if I can tell uh, like this, but in absence of oxygen, uh, we are uh, um, using this process. So we do not produce the CO2 molecules, that is uh, uh, what we want to, to avoid. Using the pyrolysis plant, as you will know, we can produce a solid part, that is our biochar, a gas, that uh, is the syngas, that we can burn in order to produce also other energy, and also a liquid part that uh, we can use to produce, for example, biofuels or other, other things. So essentially, when we have produced the biochar, what we have to do? So the biochar is the charcoal, okay? That every one of, of us know the charcoal that we use, for example, when we do the barbecue, but this is not the, the right way to use, the, to use the biochar because again, if you burn uh, the biochar, you produce a CO2 and so you are back, uh, you are back at the same point, and so you have a CO2 neutral circle. But we have to do something more. So talking about the application. So this is a strange image that I found on the internet. It is a hole in, in, uh, in, uh, in the heart. So it's only to explain that, for example, if we take the biochar and we do a hole in our, in our garden and we put inside the biochar, then we cover the hole. And then we decide to reopen this hole after 100 years, the biochar that we put in, in the hole remain inside the hole for 100 years. 100 year. So this is, for example, uh, the first things that you can think to put, uh, to, to use the biochars in order to store uh, the carbon, the carbon material in order to avoid that the carbon material back to the atmosphere. But there are more intelligent way to use the, to use the biochar. In order to um, in order to think how to use the biochar, we have to think about the properties, the biochar properties. So essentially here I have uh, created a sort of ta table where we uh, give you the, the uh, in a first glance the idea of the biochar properties. So the first things that we can observe on the biochar, it is a black material, okay? And so it uh, could be using for coloring, writing, or absorb UV, for example. Then the material essentially could be branded in a powder, okay? And so if you have a powder material, the first things that you can think that is an easy material to disperse somewhere, then it is uh, uh, it has also macro and, uh, and micro properties. It depends on, uh, on the size of, uh, of your powder. Then if you observe the biochar uh, using, for example, a microscope, uh, it depends, of course, on the biomass uh, where you start. But for example, in some biomasses, you can observe a sponge structure. So what I can do with a sponge? A sponge, I can, for example, absorb liquid in my kitchen, for example, or I can use uh, for for filtering, why not? And then essentially the biochar is a carbon material. So is because it is a carbon as also the properties of the carbon. For example, you can uh, have some electrical properties or because it's a carbon, you can functionalize this material. And so you can create other very interesting things. So starting with some uh, strange application that someone is not thinking immediately. So, uh, about the biochar properties, okay, uh, you can, uh, because it's a, a very versatile material, you can think to use it in a lot of uh, in a lot of sector from the agriculture where normally it is used, but also from industrial, also in cosmetic, medicine, high-tech application, construction, food. Now we will see some, uh, some application. So as I told you before, it's a black material. What is the, the first things if you, uh, Put in your hand some piece of biochar, what do you observe? You observe your finger that are, becomes black. And when you uh, 
uh, obtain the same results that your finisher becomes black. For example, when I change the toner of my printer, okay, when I change the toner of my printer, my finisher becomes black because inside the printer, as you will know, there is a carbon material that is a colored carbon black. The carbon black is a material that derived from the pet, the, from, from the oil. So we take the oil, we burn the oil, we obtain this powder, and this powder we put inside the toner of uh, our printer. But did you know that you can put also the biochar inside the toner of, uh, of your printer? Here there is a uh, um, uh, company that produces toner from printer using the, the biochar. So, now we are thinking about the black uh, black things because uh, biochar is a black material. What are other types of application of, uh, of the biochar? For example, in composites, what is a, a black composite if every, every one of you know? It's the, um, the well of, of your car, okay? So inside uh, this, uh, um, in, inside, uh, this uh, uh, type of polymer, normally is uh, used the carbon black uh, material, again, derived from the oil. We have to abstract the oil, we have to burn the oil, producing a CO2, of course, and we have to create the powder to put in the, um, in, the in, in the well of, of your car. You can, for example, substitute this uh, using, uh, um, using the biochar. We have uh, uh, several contracts uh, with companies that produce uh, uh, well, uh, where uh, they are absolutely super interesting to use the biochar inside them. Then near the, um, the well of, the, of your car, what there is, there is the asphalt. What is the color of the asphalt? Again, is a black material. What, why it is black? Because it contains some oil derived material. You can also think to substitute this um, this material using the biochar. And so also in the asphalt, it could be another uh, point of application. So uh, we are talking about the black material. So black material normally are black because inside there is the carbon black. You can think to substitute all of this carbon black uh, using the biochar. And so, for example, in the composite materials, observe, on, for example, on your desk, everything is black. It's black because inside there is the carbon black. You can think to put inside them the, uh, the biochar. And so you can also uh, substitute the carbon black using, uh, using the biochar. Of course, not all the types of the biochar. For every application, you need a particular type of, of the biochar, of course. Then another huge sector that, in my opinion, will be the next sector where uh, a huge quantity of the biochar will be applied will be the cement industry. The cement industry is uh, the industry that uh, uh, create um, more CO2. And so they are absolutely interested to the decarbonization of the, of the process. And so they are absolutely interested to put inside uh, the biochar. The biochar put the, inside uh, the, the cement, uh, for example, in our labs, uh, was able to uh, create uh, uh, composites made by uh, cement and, and the biochar using uh, having the same mechanical properties. So you don't change the mechanical properties of the material, but you save the quantity of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the cement that you have to put inside. For example, here there is a very nice picture made with uh, the help of a photographer that, is, uh, uh, that follow me on, uh, to, to, to explain these uh, properties where you can see a balance, a sort of balance where you have a piece of cement only material and a piece with 10% uh, of uh, uh, biochar inside. So as you can see, also the weight of the material decrease. And then, of course, also the shape of uh, the biochar that you put inside the cement, of course, has uh, uh, some different properties. And here, for example, there is a recent work that we did with uh, uh, my team where we study the um, the shape of uh, the biochar particles that you put inside in function, of, for example, of the mechanical properties that we are able to obtain.
Then back to the to the structure, of course, the microstructure that we can observe using uh, the electron microscopy. And as I told you, is essentially a, a sponge structure. And so you can think to use this material like, like a sponge, okay, of course. Then another strange application that maybe you have not yet think about uh, the use of the biochar, but biochar, because it's a sponge essentially, is a, a the absorber material. And so there are some uh, uh, of, of these things that are using with the puppy, for example, in order that are made by the biochar, because the biochar has uh, the property to absorb this, uh, this material. And so this could be another possible application of, of the biochar, of course. Then, as I told you before, it's uh, uh, we can think of the biochar like a filter, of course. And uh, for example, one of the main uh, problems that we will have in the future is the, the water, essentially the water purification. Uh, the water purification, could, uh, biochar could be used for the water purification. Here, there is, uh, for example, my team that I have in Roma Tre University, uh, where we are working on the use of the biochar for uh, the water purification. In particular, here in this case, we study a real case in the river where we can use different types of, of the biochar to test for the water purification. And uh, Lorenzo Nimali is uh, the PhD student that is working on, uh, on, this, uh, on this process. Then, as I told you before, uh, the biochar could, is a carbon material, and so as a carbon material, could have uh, electrical properties. Here on, on the right, on the, on the left, there is, uh, as a show that I found on internet, they, um, that demonstrate that the, the piece of biochar is essentially electrical conductive material. And so here I want to show you um, a device that we produced with, uh, again, with my team, that is essentially a pressure sensor made by uh, the biochar. On my right hand, uh, on the left hand, hand I have the all the device. On the right hand, I have the sensor that is essentially made by the silicon filled with uh, biochar inside. And so because it uh, it is black material. And essentially, it's uh, it becomes a conductor material that in function of the pressure that I do on uh, this uh, on this system change the electrical conductivity and so change the electrical the, the light that is uh, represented from from the lead for example this is a sensor and this sensor is made essentially by uh, biochar that has a, a very high electrical conductivity material and then i want to to show you uh, the, uh, one of the last application but not less important of course did you know that you have already eaten biochar for example in italy we have the black pizza and the black pizza is essentially uh, made by vegetal carbon what is vegetal carbon vegetal carbon it's only uh, 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 is a, a sort of biochar and so you have also eat the the biochar so as you can uh, see there are a lot of possible the application of the biochar. So every place where you can put the biochar is called a, a carbon sink. So a place where you can store the carbon instead to back the carbon to the, to the atmosphere. So what we have to do in order to try to save uh, our society is to bring back to the ground the carbon that is present in the atmosphere. But this work is made, for example, by trees and from biomasses. But what we have to do at the end of the life that biomass is, is to do not um, burn again the, the biomasses in order to the carbon back to the, to the atmosphere. But we have to lock down carbon, creating a, a biochar. And then when we have this material, we can do a, a lot of things as uh, I try to explain uh, briefly here. And so only the imagination is uh, our limit for the possible application of the biochar. And so, with this, I conclude my uh, my talk, and uh, I want, of course, to thank you to to you for for the invitation, of course, but also thank you uh, to all my team because, of course, I am not able to do by myself only only this uh, a lot of this work in a lot of uh, different uh, um, possible application. Then I want to thank you, of course, to the Italian Association for the Biochar, ICHAR, where I am a proud member of this association. 
Then I want uh, uh, to remember also that in Polytechnic of Turin, we have a, a, um, a team dedicated only to the biochar application that is called the biochar at Polito. And then I want also to tell you that there is a, a edited book uh, from the biochar on the emerging application that I wrote with my colleagues uh, a couple of years ago, where essentially I put inside a uh, different uh, kind of, uh, uh, of application of the biochar. And I suggest you, if you are interested, to, to read this, uh, this book. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you so much, Mauro. That was really interesting, especially for someone like me, who's not an expert and really not a scientist. So I found it really, really interesting and really easy to understand. I also like to say that I've had a black um, croissant before here in Italy. So <laughs> a different a different use for, for Biosha. <laughs> oh. um, okay, so we have a few questions. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll start with the first one here. Does the sequestration of carbon in the soil compensate the carbon emitted during the combustion? So uh, I don't understand. Um, so I'll just repeat. Does the sequestration of carbon in the soil composite um, compensate the carbon emitted during the combustion? So what's the balance, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the idea, the idea essentially is mm -hmm. that we have not to burn things because if we mm -hmm. burn things, we react the the carbon material with the oxygen, and so we create the CO two and the CO two back to to the uh, to the atmosphere. So what we have to do is uh, to sequestrate as. Uh, mm -hmm. To, uh, tell the the carbon the carbon material of course producing producing the biochar. So um, how much uh, uh, more carbon we more biochar we produce more carbon material we we sequestered and so we can put this carbon sequestered everywhere where, where you want. For mm -hmm. example, in, in the soil of course, but also in the composite material. Every place where we want to put the carbon is a, a carbon sink, and so the mm -hmm sequestration place. Okay, good, excellent, thank you. Um, we just have time for one more, so I'll just pick this one here because everyone wants to know about money. Um, so Marie Lori has asked you, do you have some ideas about the volume and prices of the different applications you mentioned? So it, it depends. Of course, for example, I give you an example on the cement. When you put the, the uh, biochar in the cement, of course, you increase the price of the material, of course, because you have to add a technology to, to do it. And so a piece of uh, cement that normally costs, I don't know, 10 euros, when you put the biochar inside, it costs 11 euros. So it increased the cost, of course. But you can, you have not only to think on the single piece of material that you produce, but you have to think also that you are sequestered carbon material inside them. And so, for example, uh, in the application in the soil, you are able to create a carbon credits. And so these mm. carbon credits can compensate and increase the uh, what, what uh, the money that you back from from this material, and so is not uh, what uh, I uh, I tell normally to to the people is not to, to fix only in the single step, but you have to see all the circle mm. of, of the material, and so using the 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 biochar, this is very important part that I am not talk here uh, is uh, the, the creation of the carbon credits. The carbon credits are money. And so <laughs> are money because the carbonization, the process, and so you pay less taxes, for example. This is very important. Or you can yeah. sold the carbon credit to other companies and so you can uh, back the, the money. And this is also very important, uh, for example, for the countries that are poor countries, for example, mm. in Africa or in uh, Latin America, for example, they can produce the biochar, they can have the carbon credits and the rich uh, countries have to give money to the poor countries in order to to, to in order to, to, to take the, the carbon credits. And so, for example, very big 
uh, companies like Google, Boeing, and so on, they are super interesting to the carbon credits. And so they give yeah. money to, to all the other people. Because to produce the biochar is not only possible to produce mm. in Europe or in the States, or so, but everywhere. everywhere. And of course, the poor countries can produce, they have a lot of biomasses, they can produce carbon credits and they can solve the carbon credits to the rich countries in order to compensate this difference. And so it's very important this. So the cost is compensated by the carbon credits. Fantastic. Thank you, Mauro. So now, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on. We have a lot of questions. So if you have uh, some time now, perhaps you could uh, write to the, the your response to the people in, in the question and answer box whilst we hear from Carol. So now I, I welcome to the floor, Carol. Thanks again, Mauro. And now um, Carol's going to tell us a little bit about FlexNG, um, just, a, uh, just a little bit about the concept, but mostly about the carbon char, uh, biochar characteristics and applications within the context uh, that's correct. Uh, of the project. So the floor just... is yours. Thank you, Carol. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I hope that you can uh, see my screen very well. Uh, so my name is Karol Witkowski. I'm a research engineer uh, working for IFER. That stands for the European Institute for Energy Research. We are located in Karlsruhe in Germany. And uh, we are a proud member of the FlexSNG uh, project. The FlexSNG um, project is on, uh, is on flexible production of synthetic natural gas, so biomethane, and the biochar at the same time. Uh, as you can see on the slides, we have a very strong... Carol, excuse, sorry, Carol, to interrupt you. We can't see your slides yet. Please tell me. I've already shared my screen. I'll do it again. Yes, now we can see them. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Um, so as I, as I started, um, we are a proud member of the FlexSNG uh, project. The project aims uh, at the flexible production, both um, biomethane of biochar at the same time, and at the same time in the flexible way, I would say. We have a very strong consor consortium, as you can see uh, on that slide. We have partners who are involved um, in the feedstock supply and chain optimization. Uh, we have the partners who are responsible for uh, gasification, uh, for providing us the technology as Sumitomo. We have also the partners who are responsible for the gas cleaning and the reforming of the gas, the uh, same gas after gasification. Uh, and as you can see, also the partners who are responsible for the methanation of the uh, producer gas, which is um, which is produced during the, the gasification. Uh, the project is uh, it's, uh, it's a 4.5 million euro project. Uh, the, the main focus is set here as well uh, on cooperation between Europe and Canada, so that we, so that we have also um, great partners from Canada, such as University Laval and Polytechnic uh, Montreal. So now I will go to show you briefly the, the concept of the Flex SNG project. As I said before, uh, in the project, we want to uh, we want to produce both biomethane and biochar. With gasification. As it was said before, the gasification may not be a perfect uh, technology to produce biochar due to its low uh, yields, production yields of the biochar compared to the other technologies. So thanks to the VTT, uh, we were aiming at production of the biochar here at the more flexible way. We wanted to increase the biochar yields, but we didn't really know how it will impact the properties of the biochar. So we, as IFR, we, we are responsible for evaluation of the biochar. Uh, we checked its characteristics and we also evaluated the, the way how we can utilize it afterwards. Uh, to go uh, to the next slides, I will present, I will give you some more details. So what does uh, flexibility mean here? Uh, we have two modes of the operation. The first mode of, of, of operation is the co-production. The co-production meaning that we will produce both biomethane and biochar. And any the, we have a byproduct, which is the heat, and that heat can be utilized for the, for instance, for the district heating uh, networks. And that can answer a bit the question that uh, was uh, 
asked uh, in the previous uh, presentation, uh, what makes more sense? Uh, do Shall we produce biomethane? Shall we produce biochar? I would say, let's be flexible. Let's adapt to the market conditions. Uh, let's adapt to the biochar price because so far nobody knows <laughs> how much we will have uh, uh, at the end uh, when the production uh, capacities uh, in Europe and worldwide uh, will grow. Uh, it may affect a lot the, the price uh, of the biochar, but if we have a plant that can be operated in both modes, uh, we can produce biomethane, we can maximize the production of the biomethane, which is the mode number two, and in that mode we can reach up to 70% of biomethane uh, as the output. So if we think about the numbers, if we if we look at the at the first mode, uh, if we have let's say 130 uh, megawatt thermal of the fuel input to our gasifiers, we can end with around 25 up to 35 thousand tons of biochar uh, yearly. So that's a lot. Um, of course, uh, we have to we have to keep in mind that the biomass and its feedstock uh, will not be uh, as easy to operate in the future as it is right now. We'll have to deal with uh, wastes, uh, with residues. Uh, so that is why uh, in the Flex SNG, uh, we also wanted to check uh, how we can gasify different residues uh, coming from uh, yeah, coming from different uh, different uh, uh, sources, such as uh, uh, wood residues or uh, some waste residues, uh, like municipal waste residues. <clears throat> How we produce the biochar uh, in the Flex SNG. So here you can see uh, the diagram uh, of the reactor, and that's the uh, BCFB uh, gasifier, meaning bubbling circulating fluidized bed gasifier, uh, developed by uh, VTT, and that's the gasifier in which we can uh, obtain the biochar from both. Uh, locations, either it's taken from the bottom ash on, on, or taken from the filter dust. It is operated uh, at different temperature ranges, uh, starting from 700 up to going up to 900 degrees. So the, the temperature has to be flexible in order to achieve that flexibility of uh, operation in terms of the outputs. If you want to produce more biomethane uh, after, afterwards, then we need to increase a bit the temperature if you want to go in more into the paralysis mode, then we have to lower down the temperature. Um, here you can also see some uh, some feedstock, some inputs that have been used in uh, our project. And on that slide, I just want to briefly uh, character, uh, show you some characteristics of the biochar. Um, Claudia uh, told us a lot about the different uh, parameters that uh, can be measured and checked. And, and it is true that the biochar is almost uh, carbon, uh, polar like material. Uh, we can see that the uh, carbon uh, content in the biochar coming from the Flex SNG uh, tests uh, is very high. It goes up to uh, 92%. Uh, we have uh, nice calorific values. Those calorific values are very similar to the calorific values of coke, so it's even more than the standard coal, which is used for the combustion. And, but at the same time, you can also see that we have a lot of um, polycyclic um, aromatic hydrocarbons, so PHS here, and, and that could be an issue for us. Uh, for the other parameters, uh, I, will, um, I will tell more uh, using the next slide, but just right now I would like to highlight uh, here the three main aspects. So the first one is the high carbon content. The other one is uh, high calorific value. And the third one uh, would be this uh, content of the pHs, which may be very problematic when it comes to the final application of the biochar. Why we do have them in our uh, product, this is mostly related to the temperature. So the higher the temperature is, uh, the, more, uh, the more pHs we have in our uh, product, but the higher temperature also give us some uh, advantages. So we can increase the surface area. Uh, we can um, increase also 
uh, a bit other parameters which are useful for uh, for 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 the use of the biochar for adsorption uh, uh, for adsorption uh, applications. Um, if we compare the biochar coming from Texas NG to the biochar coming from the different processes, we can see that more or less we are in line with other processes. Um, we can see we can see a difference. We can see the impact of the higher temperature on this uh, PHS uh, concentrations. Uh, we can see that the bulk density, bulk density is more or less uh, in line with the literature data. And um, we can also see that the uh, uh, calorific value is close uh, to the values which were um, which were found for the standard gasification process. What is different here is the uh, is the biochar yield we can uh, obtain from our process. We can reach up to twenty five percent of the output which is a lot compared to the standard gasification. If you have a very good gasifier, if you have, for instance, a CFB gasifier, uh, I won't mention the names of the producers, but uh, there are like two major ones in Europe. <laughs> you can have only 1% or even 0.5% of biochar um, in your bed material because the gasification is so efficient here. And thanks to our approach, we can uh, end with uh, high concentrations uh, high yields of the biochar. Uh, as I said before, having this good material, uh, rich in carbon, uh, with nice surface area, I would say nice calorific value, we can use it in many different applications. And of course, the easiest one will be those uh, which are used for the combustion purposes. So we can use the biochar for the energy purposes. We can use it as the um, feedstock for coal combustion. We can re we can replace coal. Uh, we can use it in the uh, metallurgy. Uh, so steel industry can uh, can use biochar um, if we blend it with the coke, uh, or we can also substitute a part of the coal with the biochar due to its characteristics. Sadly, because of the high concentration of uh, polycyclic uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, we cannot really propose our uh, product to be used for uh, soil amendment or to be used as the fertilizer uh, because there are some issues with, with, with that concentration. So we should rather, uh, we should rather um, try to achieve uh, as low values as possible. And that is somehow possible because as I showed you on the slides before, when you go, when we go into the paralysis mode, into this co-production mode, we can lower down the concentrations, but uh, it needs some optimization. That is why we have this project. Um, and just to give you some ideas, if we can, up, if if we can use that concept, uh, if we can replicate this idea in different countries. Um, so, of course, there is the biomass. The biomass potential here is expressed in terawatt hours, but um, the biomass potential, the sustainable biomass potential in Europe um, can vary from 100 to 400 million tons of dry mass. Uh, that means that we can produce a lot of biochar from that, but there will be a huge competition between the feedstock and its final valorization. Uh, why? Uh, not only the biochar is needed uh, to capture the not to capture but to 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 deal with the CO two emissions. We also have to uh, decarbonize the other industries. So that is why one of the goals for the European Commission is to produce um, 30, 35 billions of uh, cubic meters of biomethane in two thousand and thirty. And you can see that. Uh, it is expected that it will come. It will come mostly from the anaerobic digestion, but the thermal gasification will come uh, to us in the future, and it will be even more used. It is expected to be more used in the future, meaning that the biomethane and biochar will be needed both at the same time. Maybe there will be not that much place for the biochar, as we will need that biomass to produce biomethane, to produce biojet fuels to produce um, biochemicals. 
However, we are not alone. So FlexSMG, when it comes to the numbers, I told you before, uh, if we build the plant based on this uh, idea, we'll have the production capacity of 25, maybe 35,000 tons of biochar per year. And here we can see some numbers from the latest market overview uh, published by uh, biochar uh, industry. We can see that the total number of the biochar plants in Europe right now, it's around 170, uh, what, what, exactly that's one, 171 plants. And the production capacity is around uh, 80, 80,000 uh, tons of biochar. And that's not a lot. So we are talking about very small, um, about very small plants. It is expected that the large uh, biochar production facility will be around 5,000 tons of biochar per year. It is, uh, let's say, a disadvantage for the flex SMG concept, but on the other hand, thanks to that, we can uh, handle the biomass uh, from the local areas so that the logistic won't be such a big issue. Um, so that was all, all on my side. I just wanted to give you some ideas, some numbers, some figures coming from our um, project. Uh, to highlight uh, different uh, differences between the biochar products produced by us and by the other technologies. If you have um, any questions, uh, do not hesitate to ask me them right now, or you can contact us every time when you have that need, or just go and visit our, visit our uh, project website to get more information. Thank you a lot. Thank you so much, Carol. That was another really great informative presentation. Um, you are dead on time, but I don't want to um, cut you short. So just one question from the audience. Um, quite interesting here. It says, what biomass pathway is more carbon effective? Um, the use of biomass for fossil fuel substitution or production of biochar for carbon ca capture? Is there, do you have any kind of thoughts on this situation and this moment? <laughs> Quite a complex mm, question. Yeah, I'm just looking. Mm. But what is what is meant here by the carbon effective? Uh, I, think I would say didn't... that, uh, of course, uh, if we if we use the uh, biomass to uh, produce biochar, uh, it's not the standalone process. I mean, every time when we do produce the biochar, we also do produce the other byproducts that can be used for the carbonization of the other industries. So yeah. I would say that when we produce the biochar, we have some kind of synergy. Because, for instance, if we use the um, slow pyrolysis process, then we increase the yields of the biochar production. But we do also produce the same gas at the same time and pyrolysis oil. If we go to the fast pyrolysis oil, oil production, then we, then we increase the... Um, um yeah the, the, the oil uh, yields uh, and then we decrease the biochar production uh, capacities at, at, at mm -hmm. the same time so of course if you want to decarbonize the industry we cannot decarbonize the industry with the biochar because there are some heavy duty applications that will require um bio oils uh, or biofuels of any kind like gases or liquids um so i think that it is really more case related uh, answer because sometimes mm -hmm. it is it makes more sense to store that biochar in the soil so that we just get rid of the carbon and it's there forever but there are some applications for which we would need the biomass brilliant thank you carol and again thank you to all our speakers today it's been fantastic really interesting um i noticed quite a few questions about biomass and supply chains so i invite you now to join us for our next webinar on the 8th of May. The link is in the chat box to register, or you can also find it on our website and our LinkedIn page. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And on my side, I will try to answer the questions with, that were asked by myself after the webinar. And uh, if I'm not able to do that, just please contact me by LinkedIn or by mail, and I will Perfect. be happy to answer all of them. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye then. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you next bye. time. Bye. Bye-bye. Ciao.